Hello, hello. All right, welcome back. I know it's been quite a while. I know I'm trying to get through some uh, <laughs> videos. I think I said I was going to try and do three a week. Not going so well. I am on summer break uh, from teaching right now. Things don't really slow down. My wife's pregnant. We've got a less than one year old at home alone or home. So I look after her. We're also getting meat birds coming in. So I'm building chicken tractors and a new coop for them. Got the garden. Got a bunch of stuff we're doing around the house, putting, building new wall frames for a couple of new bedrooms we're putting in. Anyway, there's a lot going on. And last, last week, I uh, was in charge of games at our, the community vacation Bible school. So like three of the churches in the community got together. And uh, so a bunch of kids. And I have been lacking on my videos, mostly because... <laughs> I'm watching my daughter a lot. My wife being pregnant and uh, going through first trimester, she's kind of uh, confined to the couch as much as she can. So it's, I just try not to make videos while I'm watching my daughter, try to spend that time with her, or I hold her while I do my chores. That's also a lot of fun. But today, I know we should be moving on to Exodus 40. Instead... I uh, just gave the sermon this morning at my church when our minister's out of town. A lot of times they'll ask me to fill in. And I'm just going to kind of go over my sermon today. Exodus 40, it's another one of those uh, from the last few that we've done. And I will make a video on it. Maybe I'll make it later today. My child is napping and my wife is with her mother. But I also have a lot of chores I need to get done. But again, Exodus 40, it's talking about the construction of the tabernacle. So they're finally done with all the preparations. And I kind of want to do some more research. Again, the commentaries, at least the online free ones, aren't very good in these areas. And it's unfortunate because they don't really tie into the deeper meaning of the incense and what the incense burning represents and the table and what the table uh, actually represents. So I'm going to try and do some more research. We'll see what I can find. But... As far as my sermon goes, and uh, I was told it's pretty good. Then again, these people live in the community with me. They've known me since I was a kid, so maybe they're just being nice. I don't know. Maybe I give terrible sermons. But the Bible also says that, you know, this hometown is where you won't be appreciated. But I'm still appreciated. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, my sermon had, was kind of a twofold one. I started off by talking about blessings, what kind of blessings we should seek, what blessings are, and then I moved it into what Big Bear talks about a lot with the hard times create strong men, strong men create uh, good times, good times create uh, weak men, weak men create hard times, so on and so on. But I'm just going to basically run through my sermon so that, that will make sense a little bit more. I did have a couple of scriptures that I use, so I'll go ahead and read those as I'm doing my sermon theory. So I'll pull those up when we get to them. Starting off, I just define what blessings are. Now, even in Webster's, the biblical definition of blessing is a gift or a favor bestowed by God. So if you have the right perspective, anything and everything is a blessing. I mean, even though my dog here won't get his face out of my face, he's still a blessing. Everything in this world is a blessing. The grass that grows, that feeds the livestock, the livestock that feeds us, the sun in the sky that provides energy to the grass. Everything in life is a blessing. In fact, even the struggles we go through are blessings. Okay? Any, any like Olympian or person who's achieved anything will tell you it required a lot of hard work and that hard work was what tempered the steel that was in and of itself a blessing a lot of people don't understand this but that like i said in the sermon that in of itself is a blessing being able to have the great gratitude and the ability to have the perspective to see everything in the world as a blessing even the struggles that you go through as a blessing seeing things that way is itself a blessing. I know it's kind of redundant, but it's true. So anyway, I make the. I always have to have a joke in my sermon. So I made the joke that old one, sure, churchians who are watching this have probably heard it a bunch, but scientist comes up to God, you know, and tells him, we don't need you anymore. You know, we got the ability now to 
do everything that you can do. We can even take the soil from the earth, the dirt from the earth, and make life out of it. So there's no need for us to have you anymore. And God says, oh, really? Go ahead and show me, please. So the scientist bends down, scoops up some dirt, and God says, ah, ah, ah. Get your own dirt first. <laughs> of course, the idea is that everything comes from God. You know, we can't, no matter what, we can't create matter. God gives us everything. And as far as the struggles go, I use Joseph and Daniel to kind of relate from the Bible about how they understood and kept their faith through their struggles. You know, another good one would be uh, Job, that they held on to their faith and they understood that their struggles could be a blessing or should be a blessing. And the main thing is that you understand that and have faith that in all things, God is working towards good. If you believe and trust in God's will, then you'll always work towards God's will, even when it's a struggle. So then I move on and I was like, so the real question is what kind of blessings should we seek? And that's where I get into my first scripture, which was Ephesians 1, 3, pulled up for you on my computer here. May our Lord Jesus Christ, God and Father, may our Lord Jesus Christ's God and Father be blessed. For you Trinitarians out there, read that one again. May our Lord Jesus Christ's God, so his God, Jesus Christ's God, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and Father be blessed. In Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Spiritual blessings are what we're supposed to be seeking. Okay, there's earthly blessings, material blessings, and earthly doesn't necessarily mean material, that's why I say both of them, because earthly could be being seen with uh, prestige. You know, there's no material to it, but it's still earthly because it's how other people view you. So there's earthly and material and spiritual blessings. And we are to seek the spiritual blessings. Remember, the Bible says, Seek and ye shall find, ask and you uh, will receive, knock and the door will be opened unto you. But what door are you knocking on? What are you seeking? Are you seeking material blessings? Are you seeking earthly blessings? Are you seeking spiritual blessings? So <clears throat> a good example from the Bible to understand this would be when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. You know, he's asked how we should pray. And before he gets into the Lord's Prayer, he says, do not pray in public uh, with big boisterous words and loud voices, blah, 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 like the... Uh, like some people do. And he says, for they have received their reward. But instead, go to uh, behind into a private place and lock the door and pray to the God if see in your, what is it? The secret God in your heart or who knows your heart, something like that. But basically, the thing that I always notice is that they have received their reward. Now, what did that mean? Like, oh, so they got the reward, they got their prayer. No, their reward that they were seeking was to be seen as pious, to be seen earthly by their fellow man as being pious. That was what they're seeking, so they got it. They weren't seeking the spiritual blessings. Unfortunately, most people, many people, seek the earthly blessings over the spiritual. We know this from Matthew seven thirteen through 14. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. And the broad, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Like I said, most people choose those earthly blessings, those material blessings. That's what they seek, that's what they want. That's the broad path that many take. We understand that there's something greater. There's a spiritual blessing that we should seek after. That's the narrow gate, entering through the narrow gate, seeking those spiritual blessings of God. <clears throat> so, yeah, oh, and I mentioned here right after reading that one, uh, of course, this isn't as crisp and clean and professional as my sermons are. This is more laid back. But I mentioned how Christ himself was actually rejected because he refused to bring these earthly blessings. 
They wanted him, their Messiah, their Savior, to overthrow the Romans. Get rid of the Romans. Give us our kingdom back. Christ is like, no, I'm bringing you a spiritual kingdom. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> we, yeah, that's great. We want the earthly one, though. They rejected him. They rejected him for not giving them their earthly blessings. But that's never what he came for. He didn't come here to give us earthly blessings. He came here to show us and give us spiritual blessings. One more time, Ephesians. May our Lord Jesus Christ's God and Father be blessed. In Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Hello, right there. In Christ, so through Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Christ taught us to enter through the narrow gate, to take the harder travel path, to seek the spiritual blessings. They didn't want that. They rejected him. So we know we should seek the spiritual blessings. Now, of course, you can get material blessings. You can get earthly blessings, especially if you see them with grateful eyes as blessings from God and not in a prideful way as something that you earned or something like that. And if you seek the spiritual blessings, most of the time, the earthly blessings come along with them, okay? If you prove yourself to be a trustworthy, honorable person, you may never be Bill Gates rich, but you'll financially always be fine and taken care of because people care about you because you've shown that you're a good person. Now, how do we seek these blessings? That's the interesting part. Hard work and faith. Now, I took more time to explain both of these, but I also took way less time at that beginning part. So I'll, maybe I'll do them a little bit faster here, but narrow gates, hard work. The Bible's full of Jesus telling you and the Old Testament telling you and showing you that it's hard work that is required. It's not easy. You know, even Abraham building the altars. It's not easy building the altars. Right now in the Bible study that I'm doing online here, Exodus 39, 38, 37, we're getting to 40. They're constructing all this stuff in the middle of the wilderness. It's hard work. Hard work is required. And everything we know that hard work is required. Think about everything. Think about parenting. Parenting, hard work. What a blessing. You know, farming, hard work. What a blessing. Uh, it, it goes, I mean, I know, a lot, I know a lot of people's view about public schools. I understand that. But... A good teacher understands teaching. <laughs> it's not hard work in the sense, the same sense as farming, but it is kind of. It can be hard and stressful, but it's a blessing knowing or when you try to reach a child to teach them a character, moral, you know, life lessons that they'll carry on throughout the rest of their lives. It's a blessing, even though that is harder to do. It's actually easier just do a textbook lesson it's harder just to try to teach them you know virtues and morals um of course that should be what they're learning at home and you should be backing it up but anyway also faith so it's not just hard work it's faith we understand the hard work aspect that one kind of goes without saying because no one in life achieves anything without hard work really i mean there's no olympian who didn't work hard to get there businessmen they might have been corrupt but they definitely worked hard to get success in their fields. Everyone knows that hard work is required. You know, books like Think and Grow Rich, that's all you'll ever find is hard work, hard work, hard work. Faith is the part that is missing most of the time. You must have hard work and faith. Remember the public prayer guy got what he wanted. He was working hard. It was probably hot out there in his robes, praying and preaching all day long. I'm sure it was hard on his throat, you know? It was not easy. But he did it without faith. He wasn't seeking spiritual rewards because you only seek them if you truly believe in the spiritual, if you truly believe in God. You wouldn't seek those rewards if you didn't have the faith. The Bible's full of examples of people fitting into having faith but not hard work or hard work but not faith. Right off, almost off the bat from the beginning, Cain and Abel. Cain worked hard. He was a tiller of the land. He was a hard worker. Right after he got banished, he went and built a city. I mean, the dude worked hard. He had no faith. He had no faith, though. That was his thing. His offering, he gave basically like the worst of his field because, and, you know, Abel gives the best, his firstborn lamb, you know, the best of his firstborn. 
the whole point of this, the reason you give your the firstborn calf or the firstborn uh, kid, not human kid, kid is in like goat or lamb or whatever, uh, or the best of your harvest, your first harvest, is because it shows that you have faith that it will continue. You know, if you didn't think that, if you didn't have faith in the Lord providing for you, you would be like, well, I don't want to sacrifice the firstborn because I don't know how many more I'm going to get out of my herd. So I'll, I'll only sacrifice, you know, once I get like three or four or five, I'll, I'll pick kind of the scrawny one and sacrifice it. No. Cain, that's kind of what he did. He gave the worst of his crops because he didn't have faith that he would continue to get good crops. So he had no faith but plenty of hard work. Still ended up being cursed. Solomon, the opposite. Dude had tons of faith. No hard work. He was given wisdom right away. Never had to work for it. Never had to gain wisdom through triumphs and failures and life lessons. No, he's given it. And we know that at the end of his life, he wasn't a righteous man. He basically led the people back into worshiping other gods by becoming so weak because he had no hard work. He had faith, but no hard work. You know, when I, right here, track and field. Track and field is in my family. My dad was a coach, big time runner. You know, I was a big runner uh, and am now coaching. The lessons that I learned from running equate so much to this. And a lot of people might not have running, but they have something similar that they can probably relate to. It wasn't the medals that I earned or the the notoriety or seeing my name in the paper, things like that, that were, I mean, yeah, that made you feel good. But the thing, the spiritual blessings, the things that I tried to look for when I ran, I tried to gain when I ran, things like determination, willpower, uh, sacrifice, you know, focus, self-control. These are the things that running taught me. And these are the spiritual blessings that I was able to carry on into my life. And these, if you're seeking these spiritual blessings, you'll see or you'll get much more out of everything. If all I ever saw was some medals and some trophies, I got a freaking bucket full of medals. What am I going to do with them now? Excuse me, I'm 33 years old. What am I going to do with them? So, Faith and hard work. That's how you seek the spiritual blessings, which are the blessings you should be seeking over earthly and material. And this is how I went on with the sermon. I tied it into the meme or the quote the Big Bear talks about all the time, where hard times create <clears throat> strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. How does this fit into there? Well, again, one thing, I think that's a secularly made thing. I think it's missing the faith, the hard work and the faith aspect as well. But I showed how accurate this whole scenario of history is using the Bible. Going all, I mean, I didn't walk through the whole history, but I did start with Abraham. You know, Abraham was born into basically good times. He's son of a high priest actually a high priest of uh, Nimrod, under Nimrod, or advice, one of Nimrod's main guys in the city of, I believe, Ur is what it was called. He has a good life, but then he sees that obviously these gods are wrong, that there is only one God, a God of righteousness and mercy and love and justice. So he rejects this society, and now it's hard times. Now he takes a bunch of people who live in good times, basically weak men, takes them and creates hard times for them. They basically go out into the wilderness, walking around, wandering around, you know. But by the time that in the War of Four Kings versus Five, when his nephew Lot is captured, says Abraham in like 300, I want to say 19, but it's 300 and something trained men go after this whole army. It's actually multiple armies because it's Four Kings versus Five and defeats them all. Now, they've been years since they left their good life. They've been living in the wilderness. It says train, so they're training, living a hard life, created strong men. They're able to defeat these people, save Lot, all the rest of them, blah, blah, blah. Years go by. They end up having a famine. The Israelites go into Egypt uh, under Joseph. They're settling in the land of Goshen. 
Now, interestingly enough about this, and we'll say it in my studies that I talked about earlier, secular historians even agree the Egyptians never enslaved the Israelites. This is what is a cause of a lot of contention because it wasn't like normal enslavement. Normally, you would conquer peoples and then enslave them. No, they gave the land of Goshen to the Israelites in the beginning as kind of basically almost used them as a buffer between them and those other peoples that might begin to war with Egypt. But eventually, they slowly, slowly walk them into what was basically slavery. We're slowly taking away freedoms or, you know, moving them from a warrior peoples or an independent people to someone under Egyptian control. And they never outright enslave them, but they get to the point where they're so enslaved within the society that they just can genocide their whole people. It was the same thing that happened to like the farmers under Mao and the Soviet uh, Union, the people that they slaughtered. You know, a lot of these people were on, they weren't seen as slaves. And a lot of them even were on the side of the communists in the beginning. But anyway, they slowly walked them into slavery. Why didn't they leave after the seven years of famine? Why didn't they go back to the promised land, the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like they probably should have? Because it was comfortable. It's comfortable in Egypt. Look at all the, it's the breadbasket of the world at that time. I mean, and each time, okay, first, you know, we're free. This is a great place. Well, now they're making us do this. Yeah, but it's still a great place. Now they're making us do this. Yeah, but it's still a great place. Now they're making us do this. I mean, does it not sound like LA, sort of? I mean, LA is a beautiful place, but look at how they're slowly taking away freedoms and it's getting weirder and worse and worse. I mean, what's his name? Anomaly had to get out of there and all that. So, good times created weak men. Weak men created hard times for them. They became weak and they lost their faith. What happens? They end up, you know, because of the infanticide, they call out for God. They're kind of regaining their faith. But we know that they, th they had it better easier in Egypt because when they go back in hard times and Moses leads them out into the wilderness, they're constantly complaining to Moses about, we should have stayed in Egypt. This, is, this sucks. It's hard. It's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. They're nagging on him all the time. They don't have faith that God's going to take care of them. They have such little faith. They build a golden calf like the minute he goes up into the mountains to get the Ten Commandments. So their faith is low. They don't want to work hard. It was more comfortable and easier in Egypt. Eventually, they wander for 40 years. That whole generation is gone. And now it's a toughened, hardened, faithful generation that takes the Holy Land. Same thing starts to happen. We see it in Judges. They slowly start to serve other gods, serve other gods, lose their faith, stop working hard. And again, it's always work hard in faith. The reason why they would take these other gods as their gods is because the God of the Bible is about selflessness, about sacrifice, about service to him through service of your fellow man. Other gods, all these other religions at the time was about you, me. What can I get for me? How can I make my name remembered? You know, riches for me, things for me, earthly blessings for me. That's what it was all about. So, of course, that's what they, a lot of people go to, the broad path. That's the path they want to go down, these earthly blessings, so I turn away from God because God tells me not to seek these earthly blessings, to seek spiritual blessings. I don't want the earthly blessings, so I'm going to go on this broad path. And it also doesn't require me to put in as much selfless hard work. Boom. Hard times happen again. David comes along and the cycle just keeps going and around and around and around. All through the Bible. I mean, I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but it's this same cycle. And it fits right into that meme that you see all the time that Big Bear talks about of hard times, blah, 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 blah. Again, the only thing it's missing, because it's made by the secular world, is faith as well. And it makes sense, secularly even, you know, hard work plus moral society equals a good time. It's just, duh, obviously. You know, if you're working hard and you're a moral society, it's going to create good times. <sighs> So where am I at? Where am I at? Do, 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 do. Oh yeah. So I also then I read uh, Deuteronomy twenty eight fifteen when I got done explaining that. I don't know. Book of Deuteronomy. Oh no, I spelled it wrong. All right. 
Diut Rano Me twenty eight fifteen. But it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Again, if you don't serve God, if you don't morally or faithfully, I should say, I'm sorry, faithfully serve God, work hard to serve God, then the blessings are removed. And without the blessings, it's just a curse. I mean, curses aren't really like a curse. Curses is essentially just a removal of a blessing. I shouldn't say it. There, there are curses. But it's the same thing. If you're blessed, you're not also going to be cursed. So the blessings are removed and the curse are put on to the people if they don't hearken. Like, it, the blessings of the Lord come with an if. Now, I then went on with the sermon. And again, this is a very, you know, uh, not totally, uh, not like necessarily in the way that Big Bear makes jokes about, but kind of like a boomerish churchian church <laughs> that I go to. You know, I mean, they're good people, small town people. A lot of them, it's family. Like, essentially, my whole family goes to this church. And that's the way it is for a lot of the people. But they are just kind of, you know, boomers and they kind of have that boomer mentality and i kind of ended it with where do you think we are today as a society are we on the broad path of self-satisfaction and devotion and i mean sorry and devoting our work to earthly blessings or have we taken the narrow path of faithfully working for spiritual blessings where on and i had a photo of the meme you know hard times create uh strong man blah 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 I asked where do you think we are on this chart and then I said, are you willing to go against society to seek spiritual blessings and good times for the future, even if that's not the path or where we're at as society right now? Are you willing to go against the society? Do you have faith? Do you have the faith to work hard for a better future you may not live to see? And then I quoted from an Indian proverb, and, you know, I, again, I get a lot of this stuff from Owen Benjamin, but the Indian proverb is, Blessed is he who plants trees under whose shade he will never sit. I know that you fans of Owen have heard that one or similar to that. And it's funny because I could see it on other faces. Like, oh, you know, they like that because this is a big farming community, a lot of Arbor Day people, since we're right next to Nebraska, so a lot of them are like, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I plant trees. No one will sit there. Yeah, anyway. Uh, and I just wanted people to understand that there's a cycle to history. And I wanted them to understand what causes the cycle so that they can do what they can to break out of there or to make a shift to the next stage if they think we're in a bad stage or how to stay in a good stage. And it requires strong men which are hardworking, faithful men. That's what a strong man is. Someone who works hard, faithfully. It's not just a hard worker. It's not just someone who has faith. It's both of them. Personally, I think that if you have faith, you're gonna work hard. And if you work hard, you probably have faith. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Why would I work super hard if I didn't have faith <laughs> that the hard work was gonna pay off? And if I had faith, why wouldn't I work hard towards that faith? It's the same reason why I don't understand how more people of faith haven't read the Bible. You know, like, if you really have faith, you would work hard because that's what the faith would motivate you to do. If you really have faith in God, why wouldn't you read the inspired words of God? <laughs> I mean, it's not even that long. I know it's long, but, like, if it's like, these are every word to God that you believe in worshiping has ever said, and it's only like this thick, like, it's not that thick, you'd read it, right? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I then went on to the close off, up the sermon by saying, you know, if this came across kind of doom and gloomy, then I apologize. That wasn't my intent. And it actually was meant to encourage you, like I just said, to encourage everyone to take the narrow path. 
encourage everyone in the fact that all are welcome to take the narrow path that lead to the table of God, to lead to the blessed heavenly spiritual realm of God, the everlasting life of his glory. That's an amazing thing. All are welcome if you just are willing to put in the work. It's not even like you have to be the best. It's like, okay, I'm a track and cross country coach. I say, what's gonna, so let's say we're going to run, you know, repeat uh, 800s at the track. Uh, you know, I usually, I, especially later on in the season, I'll have times I want them to try and hit them in. But say we're doing seven repeat 800s. If you're willing to do the work, you're welcome to be on my team. If you're willing to try and go and do the work, I don't care if you're finishing last every time. If you're actually putting in the work and trying at the work, you know, not like jiggle dog, I don't care to be here. But if you're actually putting in the work and trying hard at the work, you're welcome to the team. I mean, you might not have a varsity, but we do have a pretty good JV team too. Uh, but you're welcome to be on the team as long as you're putting in the hard work. Same way with God. If you're willing to do the hard work, even if your hardest is nearly as good as someone else's hardest, you're, you're, you're a minute behind them in an 800, you know, but you're still trying. You're on the team. And that's the way it is with God. If you're willing to take that narrow path and just do the hard work and do it faithfully, you are on his team. And that's encouraging. You know, and then finally, I, my last thing that I went out on before our closing prayer was uh, inspirational, at least in my mind, scripture from the Bible. And it's from Galatians 6, 9. It says, so let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. To me, that's super inspirational because it can give you a struggle. You know, let's remove the just everything else let's just say you know it's it's the struggle of uh, uh working out you know you will reap the harvest you will reap at the harvest if you do not give up don't grow weary of the hard work you know don't grow weary of putting in those early morning runs or those you know noon lunchtime trips to the weight room It'll pay off in the end. Uh, you know, it's just so crazy how many people, they don't want to, as soon as things get hard, they're like, ah, uh, this will never pay off, this will never work. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, um, my wife and I are actually going on a date night tomorrow night, and we're going to see a movie by uh, Kurt Cameron, the former actor, and it's about homeschooling. And it's just funny to me that he, I saw him in an interview talking about this movie and you know, he was talking about being a parent. And he said that it's, it's really interesting. It's not until really the age of between about 17 to 23 for your children, because his ch children are older now, that you really start to see the benefits of all those seeds you've been planting, you know, like uh, trying to plant in them, you know, the the morals and the virtues from the Bible, trying to plant in them how what it means to be a good person, a selfless person, trying to plant into them what it means to be a strong man, a good woman, what, you know, what it means to be a father, to be a mother, to be a Christian. And he said it's not until they get to be, you know, these older ages that you really start to see the fruits of all those seeds, you know, because when they're young, you know, they're teenagers, they're, they can be fighting with you, they can be going against the rules, you can seem like you're, you're, you're not get, making any progress, they're not getting it. But then if you continue, just continue to do it, continue to do it, continue to do it, when they become young adults, that's when you really start to see it coming out. And that goes right along with this Galatians 6, 9 again. Let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Super inspirational. But anyway, that was my sermon uh, that I did today. It's much more crisp, obviously, there. Uh, shorter. I didn't go on as many tangents. But 
these are the sermons that I like to give. I like to have a message that I support with scripture, not necessarily just like a history lesson, like a Bible study, but an actual message that I use scripture to support that is relatable to today. And I really think this is relatable to today. In fact, it's kind of funny because you know, after church, uh, what my uncle, my dad, my grandpa, and one other guy that I'm not related to all told me that, you know, they're like, I think we're at the bottom of that photo. And at the bottom, of course, was um, good times create weak men or weak men create hard times. That's at the bottom. So a lot of them, and these are grown men, were saying that we, we're in the hard times because of weak men. I wonder how many of them would have the, you know, ability to admit that they were a part of that that created the hard times. Hopefully my uncle's not watching this. No, no, no. He's, they're, they're, they're strong men. Those, these men who I talk to are good, strong men. But I do think that their generation kind of played a part in it. But anyway, I will make it do a video. I'm going to promise myself this week I will do Exodus 40. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you, you guys get something out of this. I hope you guys un, at least now maybe have a better understanding of what blessings to seek. Maybe you've seen, changed your perspective to understand that everything is a blessing. And certainly, the, what I really want people to understand is, you know, that we have to work hard faithfully if we want a better life for the future, for our children, for our children's children. You know, it's not always going to be for you. You know, my grandpa and his great-grandpa, they did wonders for our family just by buying and terracing land here in the Lust Hills. Now we have family land that is farmable because of the terracing that they did so long ago. They didn't really get to reap all that benefit, but their future generations did. Anyway, hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon, evening, or good night. God bless.